Today on Players Only, I'm here with Ted Johnson, 10-time NFL linebacker, three-time champion with the New England Patriots. Thanks for coming on with us today. Of course, buddy, man. It's good to be on with you, Dante. Now, you were a part of that foundation, of that 95 draft class with Ty Law, um, and you guys helped pave the way for this dynasty that was built. Yeah. Um, how did you guys change the winning culture around there? Did you guys initially take your lumps? <laughs> you know, it, uh, we had a great draft class. Not only was I drafted in the same class as Ty Law, Dante, but uh, also Curtis Martin. Mm -hmm. So I was the uh, I, I didn't hold up my end of the bargain as a second rounder. Uh, the two, the first rounder and the third rounder, Curtis Martin was a third rounder. Both went to the, uh, the pro, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame. So great guys I played with. But I would say a lot of those guys, Dante, those early, those mid-90s teams were the foundation for those early 2000 uh, run. Ty Law, Willie McGinnis, Adam Vinatieri, Brewski, Lori Malloy, those guys. And so we had the foundation. We had the players. Um, and we, we just didn't, um, at, at, weren't able to put it all together. Bill Belichick comes in 2000 and keeps a lot of those guys from those mid-90s teams that Bill Parcells drafted and groomed um, on, on those early 2000 teams. And then Bill came together in 2001. Of course, we were able to, uh, to beat the Rams as 14-point underdogs, and that kind of started the ball rolling. And so um, there's kind of two parts of this dynasty. you got the first part, the three championships in four years, 01, 03, 04, and then again, uh, you know, in, in the last few years. So. It's, uh, it's been a hell of a ride, and it was fun to be part of it at the, at the very beginning, for sure. And you guys had some physical football teams. And, you know, I played strong safety and loved to oh. play a physical game. And you, too. The way that you played the game was just very physical. If you could go back to those times and change the way that you played, would you change the way that you played? And do you think that you could adapt the way that you played to today's NFL rules? Man, that, that is that is an excellent question, and I, I have to say the same for you. Man. You played the game in a way that uh, is – you just don't see it played anymore. I mean, I think uh, the rules have changed, maybe the style in which you can play. But uh, obviously, you were a very physical player. That's what you were known for. And so, and for me, too, I was a straight line player. Um, I was a, a guy that uh, – my technique that kept me in the league as long as it did, Dante, was called the stun and separate technique, where I would stun you with my the, for, the butt of my forehead – and then separate and then be able to disengage. So I always led with my head and it was a technique that I was taught in college and I perfected it over the years. And it was really what kept me in the league as long as I, I was. My ability to disengage off the of blocks and make tackles, but I was always leading with my head. I don't know if I could, I don't know if I was a coach today, Dante, if I could teach that, you know, I really don't. So um, it's just uh, knowing what I know now about head trauma, it would be tough, but um, the game has changed and it's also, it's not fighting in a phone booth anymore. You spread guys out, um, and it's more of an, an athletic kind of space game um, where you don't have downhill players and guys that kind of take guys on like they used to. And to answer your question as far as could I adapt my game, you know, I, I wasn't as athletic as I needed to be to kind of change to the adapting time. So there's a lot of times where I sit here and I wonder if I could even play in today's game with all the rule changes and what we know about concussions. I think, uh, I think it'd be hard for me to to find a spot. Absolutely. You've been a huge advocate for concussions, not allowing children to play until the eighth grade. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. you know, I feel the same. I feel the same. I really gave out a lot of those concussions that I feel remorseful for today yeah. because I realized how it really affects guys' life and not just for the short term, but for the long term. It really affects guys tremendously, tremendously over the long term. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, let me ask you a question because people ask me this all the time and it's, um, and I got to get your, your, your take on it. Um, you know, I have kids, I have young kids. I don't know you have, if you have kids, but I have a son and people ask me all the time if I let my son play. I'm curious, I'm just curious what your response would be when people do ask you, would you let your son play? And if you have, I'm curious uh, what your, your thoughts were on why. Well, I do have a 14-year-old son that does play the game of football, and he's actually in the ninth grade now. Okay. Uh, I felt like I did start him maybe a little too early. We started him probably around the seventh grade. I know that the eighth grade is when they say that you, you should probably start to play contact football. But, yeah, my son does play football. He loves the game of football, and it would actually be hard for me to take him away from something that he loves Maybe it was my fault for introducing it to him so early and him watching me in the NFL run around, yeah. or maybe it's just in him. But we tried, I tried to teach him 
the proper ways to, you know, take on tackles. But sometimes that contact is just like a millisecond. Somebody might lower their head. You might get hit in the head and there could be long-term effects. So maybe we did start them one year early, but yeah, my son does play football right now. I, I would, I would say this, there's a, uh, you know, there's a theory and, you know, it's, it's just something I, if you look at a lot of the guys that have issues, I hate to say it, we're both kind of fit the category I'm about to, to, to say here is that if you look at the history of concussions, I think not every job on a, on a, on a, in every position is created equal on a foot, on a, on a football team. Right. I agree. Strong safety, box safety, yes. middle linebacker, um, you know, uh, offensive lineman, yes. uh, you know, guys that are lined up off the line of scrimmage, the collisions are greater, right. And your job and my job was to initiate contact on every play. So you're going to have, I think there's just, it's like uh, odometer on, on, on a, in a car. You know, the more miles you put on, the more wear and tear, the worse it is for the brain. So I would steer, I, what I've told people to answer the, uh, my own question to you was, my, I would steer my son to maybe more different position than maybe middle linebacker or strong safety because I just think the other positions, there's, there's less hitting. So that's my take on it. I was curious to get yours. Yeah, so Belichick versus Brady, you know, the yeah. success that Tom is having right now in Tampa, yeah. you know, the, the, the Patriots aren't looking like the Patriots that you guys paved the way for. Who do we attribute most of that success to now, seeing what they're doing as they're not together? Wow, that is that is the million-dollar question, and it's a fascinating one. It's one of the best, juiciest uh, storylines that, that plays out here. And right now we're five games into, uh, you know, this season without Tom Brady. And it's starting to look, you know, like uh, maybe Tom, um, you know, obviously his impact was felt throughout the whole organization. And here's the thing, Bill, a lot of times, Dante, he teaches, I think he kind of constructs his team much like the San Antonio Spurs in a sense where Greg Popovich could be hard on his star players. He can be hard on Tim Duncan. He can be hard on Manu Ginobili. Um, you know, Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, those guys. And so everyone else fell in line, right? Um, and that was kind of what Tom was. A little bit, you know, to some degree, made an example out of. He always took, you know, below market contracts. He, he was, uh, you know, Bill was very critical of him in team meetings. He could be hard on Tom. And so it made everyone else fall in place. So that was the kind of the ecosystem that was created. Now that Tom is gone, who is that guy that Bill has as to kind of, hey, I can be hard on the best player so everyone else should fall in line. Right now, there, there isn't that. And so I feel a little bit of panic uh, in Bill. There were some questionable calls he had in the game last week against the Denver Broncos um, where he didn't challenge. It looked like an obvious first down by James White. He decided it was a bad spot. He did not challenge the spot. And so they had to punt. He gave away a possession. When you just kind of scratch your head, like, what's going on with that? He's making more excuses, Dante, than I've ever seen him make when it comes to the COVID. Um, you see him, you see him kind of uh, really being critical of the protocols and the position they've been put in. That is very uh, unbelichick like. So, my feeling is he's feeling the pressure and feeling the heat because don't kid yourself, bud. He wants to win without Tom Brady. That's really what's important to him is being able to win without Tom Brady. And so. He had, he had a plan in place, and his name was Jimmy Garoppolo. It didn't work out. Um, but I, I, it's, um, it's probably something he regrets is trading Jimmy away to the 49ers. And that should probably lead me in a question for you, bud. It's just what is – because we're trying to figure it out here in New England. What is the overall feeling in San Francisco? We get an idea kind of by some of the play calling and some of the pass attempts in these games, particularly in the playoffs last year and to start the season, that there isn't a lot of faith and with the coaches there with Jimmy Garoppolo, what is what is what are you seeing uh, when Jimmy plays? Well, I'm seeing a non-traditional offense. They're understanding that a lot of these guys can't drop back and throw the ball 25, 30 times a game, be able to decipher what defense you're in, get to get you into the right play, and then deliver the football on time and accurately. They've been handicapped by the college football, calling the plays from the sideline, telling them exactly which play to run, telling the offensive line in the backs where to block and who to block. So they've been handicapped. So Kyle Shanahan has gotten creative. He doesn't really need Garoppolo to throw it that many times. He just needs to throw it where he tells you to throw it. That's why he has so many screens, misdirections, plays where he can get the ball easily into the playmaker's hands and allow them to make plays with their feet. That's why they're called the Yak Attack now from Ayuk, 
to Debo Samuel, to Kittle, to everybody that they have on their offensive uh, skill positions are guys that can make plays after they catch the football. They're not relying on him to throw the ball like they were relying on Tom Brady to throw it in that offense in New England. So I think he fits in well. He just looked bad when the running game isn't going and he has to drop back and throw the ball. He makes a lot of questionable decisions. So as long as he's in this system, this type of system with a good running game, he'll be okay. But if he goes somewhere where they make him read defenses, then he'll really struggle. Yeah. Well, hey, look, we got, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this game. I, I'm trying to, I don't have a clear picture on how it's going to look. And I usually do by this time in the week. I kind of have a feeling, and I don't know. But you guys are missing both, I think, starting safeties in this game. Seven uh, out of 11 most, from last year is out on the defensive side of the ball. Seven right? out of 11. That's, and you got, I think Mostert is maybe not playing. Mostert is out. He was yeah. balling before he got hurt. Um, you know, what, what's, I mean, what's it been like? I think you guys have more guys on IR than any team in the NFL. Just are you kind of maybe surprised at the 500 record so far, considering all the guys that have been injured, some of the bigger names that's been injured on your uh, defense in particular? I'm actually not surprised. I think that they probably wish that they would go back and play the Miami Dolphins again and play that game differently from a defensive standpoint, which put them in a hole and they end up losing that football game. And then they end up losing to Arizona, I think, by four points in the first game of the season. So I'm actually surprised that they're not better than what they are. They built depth with this football team over the years. They've had their struggling years. They had the years where they had to go into major stadiums, the New Orleans Saints, beat the Green Bay Packers, and they showed that they can do that, and they've grown up from that. So the guys that are missing right now, actually all these guys are going to be plugged in. They have in-game experience over the last couple of years. But how long can you keep that boat afloat when you keep having these injuries? Because you know if you keep bringing guys off the sideline, you have to get very vanilla in what you do. And once you're vanilla, that's when the quarterbacks pick you apart. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm curious to see. I don't know much. I mean, I know a little bit about your D, court, I, D coordinator, but I'm not sure, like, maybe what his style is as far as dialing up blitzes. Because last week against the Broncos, Cam Newton was blitzed. It looked like on every, on every play. And I think it was more to kind of stop the run. It was more about run blitzing um, than anything else. Is like, we're going to stop this damn run, and we're going to blitz them. And then it affected the passing game. And so clearly the, the blitz was, was, was a big part of what made the uh, Patriots offense look as bad as it did. Uh, what's the, what, I played for that coordinator. I played for Vic Fangio, so I can tell you exactly what he okay. did. I watched that game five times. It, it might have looked like blitzes, but some of it was just creating an eight-man box from a two-high disguise, okay. everything looking the same. And then they would either bring the strong side safety down on the run where they would bring the weak side safety down in the B gap. And he's taught to, he's taught if you're the open side safety to that side and you see run, you see that guard block down and yeah. that tackle block out, you shoot it like an arrow through snow. That's what he's taught. And if it's Interest. a pass, okay. you're looking for number one or number two coming on crossing routes from the front side to be able to rob those. And then on third down and four, they had it twice. He was doubling the back. Cam likes to go to the back on his first read. He had the safety outside. He had the linebacker inside. And a lot of those other ones on long down and distances, all he was doing was hitting them with surprise zero blitzes. It looked like quarter, quarter, half across. And then the left tackle, the right tackle would tap the right guard. And then that's when all the blitzers were moving to position. So they had a tip on those guys last week because they were going silent count. And about four or five times in passing situations, he would hit them with a surprise zero or man blitz and Cam couldn't read any of it. Oh, he was totally discombobula discombobulated, yeah. held the ball too long, and the receivers weren't even ready because it was a surprise. Well, interesting. I, I just, I mean, my feeling is they maybe gave you the blueprint on how to play the Patriots offense. So I'll be curious if, if your D coordinator, got, you know, kind of does something like that. That's, I think that's fascinating. You kind of shoot the gap. If the guard blocks down, tackle out for yeah. that safety that's in the box. You're going. That's next. That's next level. That's next level stuff, man. It is because he he keeps the free safety so close and high over the X receiver that you really think it's like a, a cover two or right. a cover four. To right. where as soon as that opens up, he tells his free safety to sprint to the B gap. Don't worry about anything else. All you have to worry about is if that guard pulls, that safety goes over the top and adds in. But if not, you run through that gap. And they did it about four or five times. Fascinating. Let me ask you this, man, because 
I'm, you know, I'm going to get asked this on our pregame show on Sunday is how do you, how do you stop George Kittle? Um, my feeling is the, the Patriots will throw a lot of different looks. They're going to make sure they hit him at the line of scrimmage. Um, and the Patriots are always willing to sacrifice pass rush to get jams on explosive receivers so that they, they're delayed getting out. And then they do – he just – Bill Belichick usually gives multiple looks on George Kittle. What is maybe the best way you think to defend George Kittle and maybe the type of player you you would probably want to put on a guy like George Kittle because he's he, – I mean, he's faster than any linebacker that's going to be on the field. Absolutely. Well, you know playing first and second down defense, you can't just double a guy because guys have run gaps. So all you can do versus pass and base and 12 personnel where there's two tight ends on the field – is you could sacrifice some pass rush to get a bump on him. But at some point, some of those guys are going to have to take the hard cover and cover him one-on-one. There are certain situations, maybe in third and three to six, when you have man situations, you know that you can have a guy inside out of him, and you know that probably he's going to run shorter routes. But other than that, I don't know what you can do, but play your coverages and play them better than you've ever played them. You can trap him when he's number two and two by two. Maybe he'll run a breakout, maybe not. And Kyle Shanahan does a great job of putting him on a move and moving all of his guys around so that you can't get a beat on him. So in third down, special situational football, he won't just leave George Kittle static. He understands that he's the best player. So moving him and motioning him will allow the defense not to be able to double him. So it's about the guys that's on him. You have the hard cover. You have to man up, nut up, and uh, get the job done. Interesting. Interesting. Do you have an idea? I mean, just a feeling of the game. You- this, yeah, the last, yeah. this is a, a this has been a long time coming since the Patriots have had a must win game during the regular season. They have the Bills looming, right? The Bills are what number one in the division. Yep. They have a must win game, pretty much a must win game this week versus the 49ers. How do you think they'll react to being in a pressure situation? We haven't seen that long in a long time from a, a Patriots team. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it because I think they feel the pressure right now. They, they it's, it's been a long time since. They've lost two games in a row, let alone if they lose if they lose against you guys uh, on Sunday, it'll be the first time that they're, you know, two and four since 2000. So for 20 years, they, they, they've never they've never been in a hole like they would be in. So I, I would be if I'd be afraid to see what Monday looks like in Boston, Dante, if, if they were to lose this game, because. This is a this is a game a must win just to stay up in the division for sure. Because the Buffalo Bills, even though they've lost two in a row, look, they're, Josh Josh Allen's a better quarterback than he's than he was the first two years. They got a great um, they got a great roster there, but I think it's it's going to be more of an indictment on Bill and not being able to maybe keep Tom here. So that's going to be the big story, is particularly how Cam plays. How are they able to rebound? Um, I, I I look Cam the quarterback phenomenal phenomenal athlete phenomenal. What I wanted to see at the beginning of the season is how is he going to respond to adversity? This is real adversity. This is a town, Dante, where if you're losing, they, hit, they let you know about it. When you're winning, the greatest town to ever play, hands down, Boston. But when you're losing, it's not fun. They've lost two in a row. Cam did not play well. If they lose this game, which look, I know it's more of a toss-up game, but people around here expect them to win. If they don't win this game, I mean, I feel like, you know, the streets will be on fire on Monday. So there is a lot of pressure considering Tom's down in Tampa Bay doing well, considering yeah. the Buffalo Bills are, you know, they're only a game ahead of the Patriots, but you can tell they have a good football team. And then and, and, and some of the, you know, just a lot of Bill, – Bill's got a lot of pressure to perform now that Tom's gone. And so I th- I'm fascinated to see how that goes. Um, if, if they lose this game, it'll be a different uh, kind of narrative around here than I've heard in a long time. And uh, so it's, it's, it's to me, there's a lot of pressure on Bill to pull this one out on Sunday. Four out of the five defensive backs for the 49ers are missing in this game. Yeah. Seven out of the 11 starters from the Super Bowl in 2019. Yeah. Do you think Cam can finally get it going versus a decimated 49ers defense? You know, that to me is what they're going to have to do is dust off the game plan they had against the Miami Dolphins, which was week one. Cam Newton had 15 carries in that game. There was 15 design runs, at least RPOs, you know. So um, so there was a ton of RPOs. Um, there was a ton of where he quarterback keepers, design quarterback runs. 
Um, and, and that was, to me, the best kind of strategy to get him going and get him in the flow. Um, I, I think it's very important that the Patriots withstand the first quarter of what the 49ers give you. You always see the creativity come out, you know, in those first 15 plays from a Kyle Shanahan offense. That's, that goes all the way back to his dad when, when he was the head coach of the Broncos. And so if they can withstand that first kind of 15 plays, that first quarter punch from the 49ers, I think they can settle in. But Cam has to, I think, run the football more than he has. That's, that keeps defenses off balance, test the edges, pressure the edges, really game plan for the edges. I think the 49ers do a great job of putting pressure on the outside linebackers on any defense. So they got to attack the edges, get yards on the outside, the numbers, do a lot of quarterback design runs, and then that's going to soften them up for the play action. But they don't have the skill receivers. Jillian Edelman, great player. We all know that. But he's 34 years old, man, and he's on a bad knee. Can't do, do it, you know. And then you have a lot of unknowns after that and really no production in the tight end position. So, to me, for them to beat the 49ers, they're going to have to run the football and do a lot of quarterback design runs be real creative like they were against Miami, I think, if they're going to win this game. You know, because they got to keep the ball, too. Time of possession um, is a big part of it, and and they got to make sure that defense gets off the field so that the Patriots offense can uh, do their thing. That's what I always loved about Tom. No matter who his skill position players were, he was going to will you 10, 11 wins a year. Oh, if they yeah. went on the skid and lost a football game, I can guarantee you that was the main reason why they would get off of that skid is because he can will you to 10, 11 wins a season. All right, before we get out of here, I'm going to get your prediction for the game on Sunday, and I'm going to give mine. My prediction is the 49ers go into Foxborough and win 26-21. I think Cam and the guys will come out inspired. I think he's feeling the pressure about remaining at the top in his career, also showing that he can move a football team and actually score points. I think they'll give a great effort, but I think they'll fall just a little short. I'm going 49ers, 26-21. Okay, man, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to, it's going to be nip tuck. It's going to be nip tuck. I'm, I'm thinking a game in the twenties, just like you. I just can't imagine uh, Bill Belichick losing three in a row with all, all that's on the line. He put all his chips in with Cam Newton. And I just, you know what? Cam's come here and he has far exceeded my expectations from an attitude standpoint and a buy-in standpoint. And so I'm going to have to just think this Broncos game last week was a one-off. They've had a full week of practice. And so I just I think I think they kind of come back and they they figure this thing out because if they don't, it's gonna be ugly around here. So I, I just can't imagine that happening. I think they're gonna run a football with a lot of success. I really do, with Cam kind of leading the way. He'll be the leading rusher for the Patriots. I think Patriots win in a close one. It's gonna be very, very close. I'll say 27, 24. All right. Thanks. All right, brother. All right, thanks, Ted. <laughs> thanks for coming on. It's been great catching up with you. Looking forward to a great game on Sunday. Dante, a pleasure is mine. And, man, I, I thought you were a great player. It's really good to meet you formally for the first time. But you take Thank care, you. all right? Thank you. Take care, Ted. All right, man. Everybody. <laughs>